S'il vous plaît, dessine-moi un mouton. Bitte zeichne mir ein Schaf. Rita et lam mot mig, är du snäll? Je gusvan baro imam bekesh. Por favor, dibujame un cordero. Please, draw me a sheep. This is the best-known line in a book that celebrates the curiosity and open-mindedness that comes naturally to children and laments the dullness, fixed ideas and lack of imagination that come naturally, if not inevitably, to grand person, to adults. It idealizes purity and simplicity and exposes the futility of modern adult life, or indeed, pretty much any adult life in any age. But the essential meaning of The Little Prince is far from clear. Early reviews of the book suggest that readers were bewildered and puzzled. With time, it has become a classic, recognized as a beautiful and urgent parable. Translated into 345 languages, it is one of the biggest selling and most widely translated books of all time. It is such a secret place, the land of tears. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry was born in 1900 into an aristocratic French family, the third of five children. Before his fourth birthday, his father died, leaving the family finances in a precarious state. At the age of 17, he tended to his blonde-haired younger brother Francois through his death from rheumatic fever. He wrote at the time that as his brother died, he did not cry out. He fell as gently as a young tree falls. A line he would later use to describe the death of the little prince. Antoine went to a naval academy, but twice fouled the exams, before beginning his military service in a cavalry regiment. But this was the dawn of the age of flight. The Wright brothers made powered flight a reality in 1903. And by 1912, Saint-Exupéry had taken his first airplane ride and decided he wanted to become a pilot. So he took private flying lessons and eventually transferred from the army to the Air Force, beginning a love affair amounting to an obsession with flying that would last for the rest of his life. It must be said that he wasn't always the safest of pilots and crashed a number of planes before he left the Air Force and began a career as a pioneer of postal flights in Africa and South America. That was when he began publishing his writings about his experiences. In 1931, he published the book Night Flight to great acclaim, and it would become an international bestseller. That same year, he also married the writer and artist Consuelo Sunsin. It was a tempestuous marriage that would find expression in The Little Prince's Rose, the only female character in the book and a representation of capricious and demanding lovers everywhere, but especially of Consuelo. So he tended the flower, so too she began very quickly to torment him with her vanity, which was, if the truth be told, a little difficult to deal with. Despite his fame, he craved adventure, and in December 1935, Saint-Exupéry and his mechanic navigator crashed badly in the Libyan desert while trying to break the Paris to Saigon speed record. Miraculously, they survived the crash, but had little idea of where they were, and their only supplies were some fruit, a flask of coffee, a bit of chocolate, and a bottle of white wine. They were discovered half dead on the fourth day, dehydrated and hallucinating, by a passing Bedouin who gave them water and saved their lives. The experience would become the central event in his 1939 memoir, and he would use this adventure as background to the Little Prince, in which an aviator is forced to land in the desert and encounters a young boy wandering alone. When we had trudged along for several hours in silence, the darkness fell and the stars began to come out. A thirst had made me a little feverish, and I looked at them as if I were in a dream. Grown-ups never understood anything by themselves, and it's rather tedious to have to explain things to them time and again. After France signed an armistice with Germany and the country was overrun by Nazis, 
Saint-Exupéry went into exile in North America, escaping through Portugal. He wrote and illustrated The Little Prince while living in New York in mid to late 1942. Like his prince, the author and pilot was a soul in exile. No surprise then that this is a story of love and loss, of loyalty and separation, and of sacrifice. But flying was what he did, and despite a host of injuries, he was desperate to fight with the free French, but was too old. So he petitioned relentlessly for exemption until it was finally granted by General Dwight Eisenhower, and he flew reconnaissance missions. Saint-Exupéry was by now a famous international figure, and his participation in free French military efforts had enormous publicity value. The Little Prince was published in the States in April 1943, but the book was banned in France by the Vichy regime, a government that collaborated with Nazi Germany. All the illustrations in the book are integral to the story and were drawn by Saint-Exupéry. One character whose image doesn't actually appear is that of the pilot narrator. Saint-Exupéry did this drawing of him beside his plane, but he cut it from the final publication, probably because all the other characters are part of the little prince's own story, and to include the narrator would be to break the fourth wall, as it were, between fantasy and reality. This book was written as much for adults as for children, and the author, probably rightly, figured that mixing the fantasy characters with the grounded experience of the protagonist might be unacceptable to his grown-up readers. The Little Prince begins with an account of how the pilot drew a picture when he was a child. His picture, he called it drawing number one, shows an elephant swallowed by a boa constrictor. Perfectly logical to him, but to adults it was just a drawing of a hat, and they roundly mocked him. When his plane crash lands in the desert and the little prince appears at his side, asking him to draw a sheep and then declaring himself unsatisfied with the results, the pilot brings out his childhood drawing number one. No, 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 says the little prince. I don't want a picture of an elephant inside a boa constrictor. And this, the pilot tells us, is how he finally found someone who understood his drawing and how he made the acquaintance of the Little Prince. The Little Prince and the pilot aviator are both in crisis. The aviator will die if he doesn't repair his engine, and the boy had to leave his planet because of a misunderstanding with a rose. They swap stories and ponder issues of how to be in this world. The Prince tells the pilot that he left his tiny native planet, asteroid B612, and travelled to six other miniature worlds before coming to the planet Earth. The characters he encounters in his travels build a comprehensive, if incomplete, catalogue of human failings. The king, without subjects to reign over. The conceited man, alone, but revelling in flattery. The drunkard, drinking to forget the shame of being drunk. The businessman, who claims ownership of all the stars he can count. The lamplighter, yearning for rest but hurrying to keep up with the sunrises and sunsets on a planet that rotates once every minute. And the geographer, who should know everything but has yet to receive trustworthy data from the explorers who must provide him with the information. And then the stranded aviator, the author, who is only able to escape his predicament thanks to the intervention and ultimate death, perhaps even self-sacrifice, of the little prince. The little prince had taken diligent care of his planet, and on the morning of his departure, he carefully cleaned out his knee-high volcanoes, two active and one extinct, which he sweeps anyway, because... You never know. He weeded the invasive baobob trees, whose roots threaten the prince's planet, seen as a metaphor for the threat of Nazism and fascism and one of the reasons the Vichy government banned the book. The Little Prince also cared deeply for a single rose, whose manipulative personality drives him to leave and discover other worlds. So he hitches a ride with a flock of migrating birds and visits six other planets, each one even smaller than or barely larger than his own, before finally coming to Earth. He arrives in the Sahara Desert and is met only by a very enigmatic snake so he assumes that Earth is uninhabited. Good evening, said the little prince courteously. 
Good evening, said the snake. What planet is this on which I have come down? Asked the little prince. This is the earth. This is Africa, the snake answered. Ah, then there are no people on the earth? This is the desert. There are no people in the desert. The earth is large, said the snake. The prince then climbs a mountain to find nothing but rocky peaks as far as the eye can see, echoing his own voice. He finds himself in a garden planted with countless roses and realises that, though identical to the rose he left behind, they mean nothing to him. This leaves him devastated, reliving his conflictual relationship with his rose on asteroid B612. It takes a fox, the most intelligent character in the story, a part, of course, from the little prince himself, to articulate our need for building relationships and our obligation towards those we tame. Men have forgotten this truth, said the fox, but you must not forget it. You become responsible forever for what you have tamed. You are responsible for your rose. The fox sends the little prince to visit the roses again and promises to make him a present of a secret when he returns. Contemplating the mass of roses, the little prince realises that the most important part of a relationship is its uniqueness. Its value is a reflection of what we invest in it. Because it is she that I've listened to when she grumbled or boasted or even sometimes when she said nothing. Because she is my rose. Finally, the little prince encounters a merchant selling pills that quench thirst and eliminate the need to drink water. Why are you selling those? Asked the little prince. Because they save a tremendous amount of time, said the merchant. With these pills, you save 53 minutes in every week. And what do I do with those 53 minutes? Anything you like. As for me, said the little prince to himself, If I had 53 minutes to spend, I should walk at my leisure toward a spring of fresh water. For the little prince, there is joy and fulfillment and quality in all of life's tasks, even the most mundane. And for him, time-saving devices do little to improve our quality of life. Back in the desert, the pilot narrator is encouraged by the little prince to leave his stricken aircraft to go in search of water. They find a well and the aviator is saved, at which point the little prince declares that it's time for him to leave. Knowing that he cannot take his body on the journey to the stars, the little prince negotiates his own death. He allows himself to be bitten by a venomous snake. When the pilot returns to the spot the next day, the little prince's body is nowhere to be seen. And when your sorrow is comforted, Time soothes all sorrows. You'll be content to have known me. The Little Prince has become a classic philosophical fable for both young and old, which shows us that having true wisdom means understanding that there is no easy solution to life's problems, and yet even the most hopeless of circumstances can bring hope. As well as being a meditation on the meaning of beauty and life, it is also a book about grief and loss. The book isn't afraid of suggesting that there is inherent sadness in the world, or of pointing out the meaningless lives so many lead. People never have the time to understand anything that is worthwhile, the fox laments. They buy everything ready-made in the shops. That's why people don't have friends because they can't buy friends in these shops. All grown-ups were children once, but most of us have forgotten. For Saint-Exupéry, curiosity and exploration are vital, and it is imperative that we ask questions of ourselves, just as the little prince does. In April 1943, after publication of The Little Prince, Saint-Exupéry joins an American convoy and sailed to Algiers to join the Free French Air Force, flying reconnaissance missions reporting on German troop movements. On the 31st of July 1944, he took off from Corsica in an unarmed Lockheed P-38 and never returned. Like his little prince, he vanished without a trace. He was 44 years old when he died, 
a biographical detail that lends eerie poignancy to the fact that one day, sitting on his little planet, the little prince watched the sunset exactly 44 times. Goodbye, said the fox. And now here is my secret, a very simple secret. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye.